Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's lightning lunch session. Um, whether you're watching as we are streaming live today or um, you're catching up at a later date, we hope you really enjoy this session um, and explore the rest of the series that we'll be offering. Um, let me move to my next slide. So for those who are watching live, um, we're delivering today's session via a Zoom webinar. Um, your camera and your microphone are not enabled, so we can't see you or hear you. You can relax. If you are watching at a later date and you come up with questions as the session goes on, you can still put them into us if you email outreach at ljmu.ac.uk. Um, put any questions into there uh, and ourselves and my team or We'll try and help or I'll speak to uh, Nick. So today's session is with uh, Professor Nick White from our history department, who is going to talk us through uh, the winds of change, the Suez crisis and its impact. Hi, my name's Nick White. Um, I'm from the history department at uh, Liverpool John Moores University. Thanks very much for that introduction, Chris. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Suez 1956. I'm going to really focus upon the impact, the significance, the consequences of the crisis rather than the crisis itself. So what um, perhaps you might want to, if, if you want to know more about the detail of the crisis itself, then perhaps you can put some questions to me in the Q&A, or I'm always happy for you to email me via Chris, or I think my email address is up on the screen as well. So I'll get straight into it. Um, I'll try and speak for half an hour. Uh, Chris, you might want to sort of um, uh, remind me when I'm getting a bit, if I'm going no off. Um and I'm going to start sharing the screen now. Um, so share screen. There we go. That there, okay, Chris? Yeah, all visible, thanks. Yeah, brilliant, super. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk mainly about the consequences of the crisis. I'll give a little bit of background to what happened um, in 1956, but I'm really going to talk about the, the debate really about um, what effect this had upon um, the acceleration of uh, decolonization after the crisis, whether there are any links between the two. Now, for some reason, uh, there we go. Um, okay, now um, this is probably a, a, an image that uh, uh, I hope you're uh, very familiar with. It's been in the, uh, the news uh, very recently, of course. Um, the uh, ever given uh, the uh, evergreen uh, container ship, which uh, blocked the Suez Canal um, recently and um, caused all sorts of uh, uh, economic uh, disruption throughout the world, which emphasised, of course, oh, uh, do apologise, um, I've forgotten to take off uh, some um, sound effects, so um, we'll have to just keep going with those for the moment, but anyway, so I do apologise about that. Um, also, there may every now and then be a, a message that pops up uh, which is to do with my PC not functioning properly. And I'll, 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 you just have to ignore that as well. Anyway, um, so the ever-given blockage has emphasised the ongoing global economic and just geostrategic significance of the Suez Canal. Um, and indeed, if we go back to uh, what we're talking about today um, in the 1950s, and indeed from the late 19th century, uh, from the construction of the canal in 1869, uh, the canal had been a vital link between um, UK's European interests, its European empire, and um, its uh, possessions in the Asia Pacific area, India, Southeast Asia, and um, further on into New Zealand and Australasia. Indeed, Anthony Eden, who was, of course, the prime minister at the time of the Suez crisis in 1956, in 1929, he described the Suez Canal as the swing door uh, linking um, Britain's European interests with its uh, wider empire east of Suez. Okay, uh, and then from this map, um, we just get an idea of that significance. So here we have the Suez Canal, which goes through the middle of Egypt, um, if you like, uh, and links, of course, the Mediterranean uh, with uh, the Red Sea. What this means, of course, is that this is a, a vital uh, passage for Britain's trade uh, through the Mediterranean via Gibraltar, of course, which uh, is still a, a British possession. Uh, Malta, Cyprus, uh, also controlled by Britain. Now, of course, the big jewel in the crown um, before uh, the Second World War was India. Um, but uh, by the time we're talking about India, of course, has uh, long uh, has become independent. But um, 
It's also very important linkage for Britain to its Southeast Asian possessions, which are of a huge economic significance in the post-war period, but also perhaps um, also to Hong Kong, I should say, um, and but perhaps really of far more significance actually in the longer term in terms of uh, trade, and also a sort of sense of um, you know the Commonwealth are of course Australia and New Zealand. And the great advantage of the Suez Canal, of course, is that it avoids you having to go around the bottom of Africa uh, to transport um, your goods and also for your, your, your um, Royal Navy operations as well. So absolutely vital to British strategic, geostrategic interests um, and economic interests, trading interests as well, which is emphasised by you know, a couple of posters here from the pre-World War II period, uh, the Orient Line to Australia, uh, there we have a, a British ship passing through the canal, uh, rather stereotypical of the time, of course, um, uh, visions of uh, Egyptian society there. And then this Empire Marketing Board poster from 1928, uh, again, with you know, British ships passing through the canal. OK, and in fact, so important was the canal that Britain was uh, prepared to resort to international warfare, of course, um, and here we have in 1956, um, the landings of uh, British and French troops as well, actually, in November 1956, um, after the nationalisation of the canal. So um, previous closures, actually, of the canal uh, have involved international warfare. Um, not, fortunately, recently in the Ever Given case, but, um, you know, this is an area which has been fought over. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to talk about one of those uh, big fights, which was uh, in 1956, uh, which resulted in the closure of Canal uh, between 1956 and 1957. And this is supposed, of course, had major consequences for the end of Britain's empire, um, not just in the Middle East, um, but everywhere, um, throughout Africa um, and throughout Asia. Um, so a little bit of background on the crisis before I go into the consequences um, and apologies again for the uh, uh, karate chops. Um, now, the nationalisation of the Anglo-French Suez Canal Company uh, then in uh, July 1956 by the Egyptian government, um, not immediately, but after all sorts of uh, you know, attempts to resolve the crisis um, and uh, a lot of subterfuge on the part of the British uh, and the French and the Israelis, we get the Anglo-French invasion from the end of October 1956 into November 1956, um, which follows um, Israel's attacks uh, upon Egypt uh, on the 29th of October. Uh, and supposedly the British and French forces come, of course, uh, to restore peace uh, in Egypt. Their real aim, however, and the real aim of the British particularly, is to overthrow uh, President Nasser, institute a friendly pro-Western regime, um, and um, hopefully, um, therefore, regain control of this vital link between Britain's European and its uh, Asia-Pacific interests. However, unfortunately uh, for Britain, um, President Eisenhower is very, very angry about this. He sees this uh, as, you know, 19th century methods being used um, in uh, the 20th century. This is sort of imperialism which should have died out, you know, by the Second World War. And so he uh, basically financially blackmails Britain into, uh, given the wider Cold War context, fear of uh, spreading Soviet influence in the Middle East. He basically uh, blackmails Britain um, into uh, leaving the canal um, only when Anthony Eden agrees um, to uh, withdraw unconditionally um, British forces. Um, Eisenhower then says, OK, um, I will help you out with your uh, financial problems and comes up with a rescue package. Um, and this leads to withdrawal. Uh, British military withdrawal uh, in December 1956 and handover uh, of responsibilities for um, the uh, crisis to the United Nations, which effectively means um, restoring uh, the canal to the Egyptians. So really humiliating um, climb down there. And it's a classic example, clearly, of uh, international intervention in a decolonization dispute, the way in which um, both US and United Nations disapproval of a British action uh, overseas uh, leads to you know, a very swift withdrawal. And 
supposed to have even wider consequences. You know, this is sometimes seen as the key turning point in the dissolution of the British Empire, not just in the Middle East, but globally. And that's really what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of the lecture. So does it matter? Does it have fundamental consequences? Well, from the 1980s onwards, indeed, uh, uh, sort of 30 years after the crisis, uh, we have reflections by, um, first of all, um, a, a journalist, actually, not a historian, a guy called Brian Lapping. Um, and he produced um, a series of films um, which are absolutely brilliant, and you can see them on YouTube, and I've actually given the, the, the um, YouTube um, address there um, for the, the Egypt uh, episode. But, you know, great source, actually. Lots of primary source uh, material there, because there are interviews with people who are involved in many of these decolonization events at the time. Anyway, Lapping produced this series of programs for Channel 4 in 1985, and he also wrote a book that accompanied that, and um, some articles uh, which have... Um, uh, which he published as well. Um, and he's basically says, yes, this is, this is you know, the key turning point. British realised that decolonisation had to now go ahead swiftly. You could not use 19th century methods anymore. It was no longer to act, uh, possible to act um, you know, as a global power unilaterally as well. You have to do things uh, in uh, concert with the United States. Old style imperial defense system has to be dismantled, therefore, and quite rapidly from uh, 1957, you have a defense review, which leads to Britain shifting its uh, defense strategy away from large scale conventional forces with big military bases in places like the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was Britain's largest military overseas base, defending that trade route. Go away from that and switch increasingly, of course, to nuclear weapons. Um, the other thing which apparently uh, comes out of Suez is increased interest in the European economic community as the economic future, rather than relying on you know, this global trading system which had built up in the 19th century, 18th, 19th centuries. We now go fully into Europe, supposedly. Um, and in 1961, you get the first application, of course, by the Macmillan government to um, enter Europe. Okay. And um, it's not just uh, journalists who say this, uh, it's also um, serious historians. Um, and um, one of the, the, the uh, leading imperial historians of the 1980s, 1990s, Rob Holland, uh, in those days based at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, University of London, he agreed fundamentally. Um, and very interesting thing that he pointed out uh, was not so much that um, the Americans engineer a coup after uh, the Suez crisis to overthrow Anthony Eden, but they certainly give a lot of backing and a lot of support to the replacement of Anthony Eden by Harold Macmillan, who is seen as a more reliable, more pro-American, uh, more Cold War oriented rather than empire oriented prime minister. And of course, we all know the story about Macmillan forcing the pace uh, of decolonization, particularly from 1959 onwards, uh, when he uh, has a resounding election victory and in partnership with Ian McLeod, of course, they promote the wind of change, that famous speech uh, which Macmillan makes to the South African Parliament in which, you know, he basically says nationalism is a fact of life. We've got to accept it. And the quicker we get on with decolonizing, the better for our interests in the, in the, the, the wider term. And supposedly this is very much reflective of Macmillan's desire to restore the Anglo-American relationship. And a key element in that, say Louis and Robinson, uh, is working in concert now, not unilaterally, working in partnership with the United States in uh, what uh, used to be referred to in those days, of course, as the third world, developing world, emerging markets, um, So, and particularly in Africa. And so Macmillan falls into line, if you like, with um, the JFK strategy, and in a way we kind of see it here in this marvellous cartoon uh, from the Evening Standard. And thank you very much to the wonderful University of Kent British Cartoon Archive, um, which has done a fantastic job in collecting together uh, these wonderful political cartoons, uh, not just from the 1950s and the 1960s, but from, um, you know, all the 19th, 20th century um, more widely. Um, and this fantastic cartoon by Vicky here, where you've got Harold Macmillan, you know, asking uh, JFK, this is in 1962, asking JFK if he can be, you know, the hind legs of the pantomime horse. 
Um, so Britain accepts after 1956 that it is a junior partner to the United States. Um, and certainly you get a very, very close relationship develops actually between um, Harold Macmillan and JFK. And one part of that, of course, is clearly pushing uh, or accepting decolonization. And you get the rapid, um, after 1960, 1961, you get the rapid dissolution, of course, of Britain's empire in Africa as a consequence of this. So that's the argument, I suppose, for, you know, watershed, significant event. However, lots of other historians however, have said, oh, hang on a minute, um, let's not get overexcited by, you know, assuming that uh, the world suddenly changed in, um, you know, after October, November, 1956. So did it really matter that much? Well, I suppose first off, point to make is that the swing door was definitely still open. Um, you know, it's not as if after the Suez crisis, um, you know, Britain is no longer able to use the Suez Canal. Okay, it's in Egyptian hands um, and it's run by Egyptian personnel, but it's actually run very, very efficiently by the Egyptians, despite um, you know, the fears of British ship owners and indeed uh, British politicians like Anthony Eden, that the Egyptians just couldn't run the canal properly. They've done it fantastically well. And I've spoken to um, British shipping executives actually about this, uh, who confirmed this, you know, it was very efficiently run and there were no problems. Um, and by May 1957, you get the first British ships back on the canal, traveling through the canal and um, you know, going um, very successfully. My apologies, want to have a sip of tea. Um, you know, trading still very successfully. The difference, though, perhaps is that the canal is, is vulnerable to international warfare, though. Um, which in a sense had been shown, I suppose, by the 1956 events. And following the uh, Six Day War in 1967 and then the um, war in 1973, um, the canal is actually closed for a very long period of time, 1967, 1975. So the, the, the recent ever given um, you know, blockage is, is tiny, actually, in comparison with, with that very long closure, which is a result of international warfare. But, you know, in normal circumstances, you know, Nothing really changes, you could argue. Um, and in fact, if you want evidence of that, um, there's a YouTube clip here. Um, what have we got? I've got about 10 minutes. So um, I, I don't think we'll watch that, actually, because I want to emphasize a, a few more points. But have a quick look at that um, marvelous scene from um, the film uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia from 1962, which, of course, is about the First World War. Um, it's not about um, 1962, but in that clip, you will see uh, a magnificent um, UK-owned vessel uh, of the Blue Funnel Line, which I'm very proud to say uh, was based in Liverpool, um, and one of the premier British shipping companies and one of the biggest users of the Suez Canal. And you will see in that scene that British, one of the, one of the Blue Funnel Line ships going through the canal. Um, and I guess I'm not quite sure when the filming was done for that, but it was definitely after the Suez crisis. So you've got evidence there that British ships are still using the canal. So let's not get overexcited and think that, well, that's the end of, you know, Britain's trading empire um, via Egypt. No. Okay, but let's go back to the, the really big issue, I suppose, which is the wider decolonization. Well, um, two historians um, writing round about the same time, actually, it's very interesting, you know, historians always rowing with each other, of course, um, not necessarily verbally, but, but in, in written form. And two historians um, writing round about the same time as Rob Holland came to a very, very different view about Suez. Uh, and that's Andrew Porter and Tony Stockwell. And they emphasise the continuities pre and post Suez. And I suppose what they're getting at here is a bit like, and to use the analogy again of the ever given ship, um, it's very, very difficult for, you know, just like a great big tanker or a great big container ship, it's very, very difficult for uh, the ship, and in this case, policy making, to change course. It takes ages to swing from one policy to another. And what they emphasize, therefore, is actually the continuities, not the changes 
between the pre and the post Suez situation. And what they particularly point out is that the 1957 Defence Review, which Brian Lapping places a lot of stress on in this shift from empire defence, if you like, to nuclear, to nuclear deterrent, um, it couldn't have taken place. That Defence Review could not have taken place between December 1956 and the publication of the report in 1957. That's not how Whitehall operates. Whitehall operates over years. And indeed, really, that switch to nuclear away from conventional defence and therefore, you know, the implications for we're not going to be able to defend the empire anymore. That goes back to at least 1954. So in other words, this was in train before the crisis. May have accelerated it, yeah, but it just really confirms, you know, the way in which policy was slowly moving, like that great big container ship. Um, and therefore, um, their argument really, uh, which uh, applies to decolonization more generally as well, is that the real influence on decolonization and Britain's retraction of empire uh, was the domestic economy and the constant need from the Second World War onwards, right through to the end of the 1960s, to cut public spending. Um, constantly, Britain is trying to trim its overseas commitments. And of course, in a situation where the welfare state uh, is a very, very popular thing in post-war Britain, you can't trim over, uh, public expenditure, you can't trim uh, the National Health Service, uh, old age pensions, um, popular uh, secondary education, things like that. But what you can do, because uh, that, that will lose your votes, but what you can do is trim overseas commitments. And that really, for Porter and Stockwell, is the fundamental. And that's not really changed by Suez. Um, you know, it just, the same policy continues. And Tony Stockwell has written on his own more recently about this. Um, and um, I hope you can get hold of this, actually, through, um, through JSTOR or, or if your, your schools have subscriptions to um, History Today. Um, there's a very neat little article, actually, History Today, in su summarising um, a, a bigger paper by Stockwell, published in November 2006, called um, Suez and the Moral Bankruptcy of Empire, I think is the title of that. And, and he develops this argument um, further in there. Um, and one thing that he points out, of course, is that um, if you see Suez as a, well, Suez is not a watershed. If you look at the huge, despite these pressures on Britain to reduce overseas commitments, the paradox here is that after Suez, Britain still retains massive military presence east of Suez well into the 1970s. And the East of Suez strategy, um, you know, is only really abandoned um, 1967, 1968. Um, and we've got a marvelous map here from um, Andrew Porter's uh, Atlas of British Overseas Expansion, uh, which illustrates the way in which, despite the Suez crisis, Britain still has worldwide global ambitions. And if anything, the East of Suez strategy is uh, recommitted to after the Suez crisis as a means of maintaining Britain's global interests and kind of almost making um, the Indian Ocean into a kind of British lake. So this kind of Indo-Pacific um, strategy uh, continues despite um, you know, the humiliation of the Suez crisis. Um, and... This means that Britain has military commitments, but also huge economic interests uh, in this region well into the, the 1970s. Um, and so, for example, um, yes, OK, um, we can't. Britain is unable to um, get control of the Suez Canal. Yes, but huge ambitions, particularly uh, east of Suez in the rest of the Middle East, uh, around Aden, the South Arabian Federation, British involvement also in Oman, uh, military intervention, military intervention in Aden, of course, uh, also in Oman to preserve British interests there. And perhaps even more importantly, though, in economic terms, certainly, uh, of course, are the Gulf states where Britain's um, biggest overseas investments are, are uh, centred. Uh, on um, the petroleum industry, of course, the, the, the oil industry there. 
Um, and really, and Kuwait, for example, really takes off actually in the late 1950s after the Suez Crisis in terms of oil production. Um, so Britain still retaining huge interests and also military uh, commitments in um, the Middle East. But after Suez as well, there are plans, it never goes ahead, but there are plans to actually develop a military base in Kenya. Um, and um, independence comes much quicker uh, for Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda than expected. Uh, but, you know, in the late 50s, there, there, are, there are plans to build that up. Now, India, of course, independent in 1947, and also splits, um, of course, um, you know, the partition of India into India and Pakistan. And Britain is unable to use India, uh, therefore, as a military base anymore, and likewise uh, withdraws uh, its military commitments from um, Ceylon, Sri Lanka today, uh, by the late 1950s. Uh, also, of course, we have the India-Pakistan problem, which um, you know, is why India and Pakistan fo focus their, their military attention on each other, actually, um, rather than assisting Britain. But further afield uh, in Southeast Asia, Britain's new biggest overseas military base will be Singapore, uh, which replaces Suez, if you like, as, as the British overseas base. Uh, and there's a British military presence there until the mid 1970s. Um, and indeed, between 1963 and 1966, Britain actually intervenes uh, and assists uh, the newly independent state of Malaysia in its confrontation with Indonesia. And it's reckoned that at the height of the uh, confrontation with Indonesia between 1963 and 1966, there were 68,000 British troops in this region. So despite Suez, um, yes, we do have the acceleration of independence for uh, and the creation of Malaysia, but there is still accompanying that huge military commitment. And of course, let's not forget um, Hong Kong as well, where Britain still retains uh, colonial status and uh, a significant military presence. And of course, this is all geared often to, to defending what are still regarded as prime British interests, particularly in Australasia. Why is Britain so interested in Singapore? Well, it's so interested in Singapore because it's the outer defense of Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I should also point to this place here, Diego Garcia, which ironically uh, actually um, you know, in an era of decolonization, is actually recolonized in 1965, is split off um, from Mauritius and um, is created as a separate colony. Uh, and Britain still retains colonial status of Diego Garcia. And if you know anything about recent events, uh, of course, this is a huge American uh, it's a British colony, but it's used as a huge American military base in the Indian Ocean. Um, so, you know, don't think that Suez in 1956 means complete British withdrawal uh, from the rest of the world. Far from it. Britain still has global ambitions, and particularly in this Indo-Pacific region. So, historians have pointed out that there's probably more, not less commitment in Aden, um, in Oman, um, and in the Gulf uh, after Suez. I mentioned already this confrontation between 1963 and 1966 between Malaysia and Indonesia, which is backed by Britain, also involves Australian, New Zealand troops, great Commonwealth um, kind of enterprise here, which is still going strong, um, you know, seven years uh, after the Suez crisis. And what's interesting also is that if we go back to the crisis itself and its immediate aftermath, that Anthony Eden writes all, you know, has, has his thoughts about the crisis just before he resigns at the end of 1956. And he makes no reference whatsoever, actually, in that for the need for rapid decolonization in his Lessons of Suez. In fact, the Lessons of Suez, uh, which was released to the public uh, after being held back uh, from public release um, sometime in the late 1990s, can't remember who precisely when, is a really, really dull and boring read, actually, because, you know, everyone was thinking, oh, great, it's going to be, you know, in talking about need for decolonization and the rest of it. No, doesn't really mention it at all. Um, and as Anthony Lowe uh, has pointed out as well, it's remarkable if you actually look at the records of the colonial governments in Africa, for example, they don't mention Suez really at all. I mean, obviously, you know, they've got to report that something's going on there, uh, but they don't, 
you know, see it as having any influence on changing their course, on changing policy at all. And in fact, for uh, Anthony Lowe, this confirms really that, um, you know, it's nationalism, which is the key factor in decolonization, and has got nothing really to do with Suez per se. Um, and that we really need to focus upon individual colonies and the growth of nationalism in those individual colonies. The problem with the Suez as watershed argument, of course, is that it suggests that Britain somehow controls the decolonization process, because after 1956, Britain decides to accelerate decolonization. No, says Tony Lowe, that is completely wrong. What forces decolonization is the strength of nationalism in particular territories at particular times, not what Britain wants to do. Britain is forced out of empire by the strength of nationalism, not by reassessments after Suez. And if we look at uh, the two countries which become independent in 1957, certainly they're already on the conveyor belt to independence before the crisis. It's already been agreed in London that Malaya will become independent in August 1957. Ghana will become independent in March 1957 before the crisis. And at the same time, however, while Britain is increasingly losing control of events, this doesn't also suggest that Britain had thrown in the towel. Because one of the key strategies which Britain still adheres to after the crisis in 1956 is to try and develop this kind of nice, fluffy, cosy, um, politically correct empire called the Commonwealth, in which we will translate imperial relationships into a new partnership, but in which Britain, of course, will be primus inter pares, first amongst equals. And so this pursuit of influence and informal empire continues after Suez. And the EEC application in 1961 is not necessarily a great watershed either, because one of the sticking points, of course, uh, which means that Britain doesn't get into Europe until 1973, is trying to preserve Commonwealth trade while also having the EEC, having your cake and eating it, if you like. Um, so Britain's still very much committed to Commonwealth trade. And as I showed from that diagram, you know, it, the military commitments as well, of course, emphasise that. Um, and, you know, this continues also into the Wilson government, the Labour government of 1964 to 1970. And it's really... Um, the devaluation of November 1967, which forces Britain's withdrawal from east of Suez. But even then, Edward Heath, um, despite you know being very pro-Europe, um, he still negotiates a five-pound defence agreement in 1971, which you can read about in uh, Benvenuti's article, um, which, um, although it withdraws uh, lots of troops from Southeast Asia, um, it still... Um, has a British commitment to help Malaysia and Singapore should they be attacked from outside. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Diego Garcia continues as a British colony um, in uh, the Indian Ocean. And in fact, Britain doesn't leave Brunei until 1984. And in fact, the SAS uh, and the British Army uh, more generally uh, continues to use Brunei despite its independence in 1984 uh, as a jungle training um, area. So there's a danger, therefore, I think, of exaggerating the influence of Suez on decolonization. The world did not. It, it was a very, very important event. Uh, it leads to Britain um, you know, being uh, castigated at the United Nations. It's a very ugly, very unpleasant time for British diplomats. Um, you know, it's a massive embarrassment. It's a massive humiliation. But Britain gets over it remarkably quickly, actually. And you could argue what is more important uh, are the continuities which link the early 1950s to the early 1960s, rather than dramatic changes from Suez. And I'm sorry if I've gone on a bit too long there. If you want to read more about this, sorry, shameless publicity here, available through all good online retailers, uh, is my book, Decolonization British Experience, which, which has a, a longer chapter um, on that question. And I do apologize, Chris, for going on um, too long there. Oh, that's, that's fine. I was... Um... That was really, really fascinating. I'm sure will help a lot of students who are studying decolonization in, in their A-levels uh, this year and, and in the future as well. Um, right, if I just share another slide. 
Um, so um, we hope everyone found today's webinar useful. And there's a couple of links up here. If you want to find out more about the lightning lunch sessions, um, you can follow this link. It's quite these are links are quite long and, and wordy. If you go to uh, the LJMU website and type in outreach or lightning lunch, you should find it. And um, there's a, a new web page with new information for, for students. Um, moving forward micro site with link with the uh, information regarding um, COVID-19 and things like that. So again, if you go to our website uh, and type in moving forward, you'll find that. Um, and yeah, I can see we haven't received any questions as we've gone along. So I think the, the majority of the engagement uh, with this session will be in classes uh, at a later date. So as I mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions that you want to ask following um, the session um, that we've recorded today, then email us at outreach at ljmu.ac.uk um, and we will happily reply to you uh, and if necessary, get in touch with Nick to answer any specific questions related to the content. Um, but that's everything for today. I don't want to keep you any longer, Nick. Thank you so much for doing that session. We do have another history session coming up in the Lightning Lunch ses uh, session. So um, explore that series there. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Um, but thanks for that, Nick. Thanks very much. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, and uh, as Chris says, um, you know, do, do get in touch if you, you, you want to, to uh, find out more. Uh, or you want some um, hints on sources or whatever. Great.